Being a dad isn't always easy, but it's the best thing I ever did. I'm constantly improving myself to be the best dad I can be through fitness, nutrition, mindset, and lifestyle. As fathers, we pass on many things to our children, such as our mindset, our habits, our attitude, and what we've learned along the way. Each of these will shape who our children are and who they will become. The Warrior Dad's mission is to help you become the healthiest version of yourself, to hone your edge, and to live with purpose. My name is Jim Bartomey, and this is the Warrior Dads Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the Warrior Dads Podcast. Today I have a really special guest. His name is Blake Hayes. Uh, so before I bring him in, I'm going to give him a quick introduction, and we're going to be talking about essential parenting. So, um, Blake, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I love the podcast. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you very much, and you're welcome. Um, so real quick, Blake is the head instructor of Sheepdog Tulsa. He serves as a primary hand-to-hand instructor and is Sheepdog's legal use of force expert across the country. Uh, Blake has been a licensed attorney for over a decade and has lectured on using deadly force within the law to thousands of people. He also has a lifetime of experience in various response training. An amateur boxer, an amateur boxer in his youth, he has taught people to apply boxing skills to self-defense for over 20 years. Blake earned his black belt in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in 2012 and has extensive training in Muay Thai. He is also an NRA certified pistol instructor and Oklahoma Self-Defense Act instructor, which is concealed carry. So. Uh, Without further ado, Blake, again, thank you so much for being on the podcast, taking the time, and um, just give give some people anything that might not be in that. That was was a pretty good intro uh, and little bio, but uh, what what are you essentially known for? I started out, like the bio says, doing boxing when I was growing up, and uh, quickly you know, once the UFC came out in 1993, I would have been 13 years old. I saw that there was more to being able to defend yourself than just standing up and throwing punches. That if somebody wanted to take you to the ground, that it could be a problem for strikers like me. So I did the best I could to seek out Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and it kind of took a while for it to make it to my part of the country. But once it did, I trained as much as possible and kind of got a little more well-rounded. And then eventually, you know, I was training with a lot of guys that were training for mixed martial arts fights and just being kind of reliable and, and somebody who was used to teaching. Um, I ended up coaching some of those people and they ended up several of them ended up fighting in the UFC and some other big MMA organizations. Um, so I've spent a lot of time, you know, coaching in that sport. And then I've really kind of transitioned in the last four or five years more to trying to teach police and military and, everyday civilians some of the same skills because those are the people that are going to need them to be able to protect their lives and protect their families whereas somebody's going into an mma fight has made an agreement to fight somebody their size and their weight on an agreed date with rules that are put in place to keep them both relatively safe and um so i just kind of decided my time was better spent teaching people like police officers, for instance, who don't always have that much training and are forced to go into dangerous situations, sometimes outnumbered, sometimes with a bigger suspect and person who's armed and all that. So been focusing on that and also raising my kids and being closer to home. I've got a school here in Tulsa called Sheepdog Tulsa, sheepdogtulsa.com, and we teach um, self-defense here and I teach a kid's class and both of my sons are in it and lots of my friends' kids are in it and definitely believe in being a warrior dad and trying to train the next generation to take the mantle from us when we're too old to fight the battles ourselves. (laughs) I love that. So you you mentioned your hometown and how it was hard. Is that still Oklahoma? Yeah, Tulsa, Oklahoma is where I live. Right. So, you know, getting a, a qualified jiu-jitsu place in Oklahoma. Oh, right. Sure. I mean, that's got to be tough, right? Because I've never actually done jiu-jitsu myself in a studio yet, um, uh-huh. which is actually something I'm looking to do because we, we had signed my son up for a local place around here and he got to do a two-week free trial and he absolutely loved it. 
Right. And we were actually going to sign them up after we got back from Disney, which was at the end of February, beginning of March that we went and we were going to sign them back up. Uh, and then baseball started and we just never got around to doing it. And um, so I was looking at some other places too, that were a little bit closer because I was about a 20 minute drive, which actually isn't too bad, but we have some other local places. But one of the things I found out about is you have to look at the lineage of definitely the instructors and so obviously you yes. mentioned gracie but then i've heard you even have to dig deeper into the gracie lineage as well sure yeah so um when i really got into jiu-jitsu i um found an instructor leonardo xavier who's from the gracie Amaita academy in rio de janeiro which is the original academy that was started by elio gracie and um he's trained his whole life there under Elio's son, Hoyler, or his sons, Hoyler, Holker, Hickson. Um, and um, he got his black belt a long time ago there, and he moved to the United States and started teaching people. Originally, he was in New Orleans, and he moved to Houston, where he still is, actually Sugar Land, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston. And um, so he was really a direct linked to the source of Gracie Jiu Jitsu and had trained with the thing whole life and certainly had a lot to offer. Also, wow. uh, Carlos Machado, who's one of the absolute legends and should be on the Mount Rushmore of Jiu Jitsu if there was one, uh, moved to Dal the Dallas area in the late 1990s and trained some of the great Jiu Jitsu Americans there, like Rafael Lovato Jr., who got his black belt from Carlos Machado, and Orlando Waugh, who's an excellent instructor in Arlington, Texas, which is my hometown that I grew up in. Um, so, uh, Orlando is kind of my, what's I would say is my main instructor now um, at this age. And um, he's also, my dad's instructor, I got my dad into jiu-jitsu when he was in his late 50s, and he got his black belt in his late 60s. Did he really? Yeah. So That's amazing. We've got three generations of Hayes men that are training, and it's a lot of fun. keeps us all together. My wife is also close to getting her black belt in jiu-jitsu, has been doing it for a long time in between having kids and everything else. So it's definitely a family business. You guys roll at home? Occasionally. It's funny. We spend so much time at the gym that when we're at home, it's kind of the last thing we think to do. But we do have mats here, but our gym is just about a block away. So if we wanted to, oh, that's convenient. if we needed to settle a conflict, we could just drive down there. <laughs> Instead of going to hit the heavy bag, you hit each other, huh? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so you mentioned with the kids. Um, so before we get into, you know, the parenting, I'm, I'm a little intrigued. You're saying that you're training kids. Is it just primarily jujitsu because you have, um, you know, the background in Muay Thai as well. So wh what do you train the, ch the kids that come into your studio and what age ranges are they? Yeah, I've tried to, you know, as far as my background in martial arts, I've tried to spend a lot of time working on what seems to work best in real life confrontations, which are, in my opinion, jiu-jitsu, boxing, Muay Thai, wrestling, judo, uh, those kind of things. Um, so I've spent all, I spent years, you know, working on each of those styles. And then within that is kind of being able to combine the best of each of those individual fighting styles into kind of a, and a martial art in and of itself, which is just kind of the transition between different techniques that you see at the highest levels of mixed martial arts. Um, mm -hmm. So for the kids, uh, we teach a lot of the jiu-jitsu stuff, a lot of, you know, we do teach them some basic striking, but with kids defending themselves against other kids, it's a lot more humane to just grab somebody and control them and put them in a position where they can't hurt you and you don't have to hurt them. Whereas if you use boxing, for instance, to defend yourself, it requires you to punch the person repeatedly. <laughs> And that just is not something that anybody likes to see kids doing to other kids. So um, we try to sh we try to show them, you know, how to be a little bit humane with their defense and just get a hold of somebody and control them and wait for the cavalry to come, whether that's the parents or the teachers or whoever. Yeah. So with 
teaching you were, how many kids do you have? I have two boys, a nine-year-old son and a six-year-old son. And they both do jujitsu? Yeah. Okay. When did your six-year-old get involved? Uh, at birth. Uh, <laughs> both of them have just been since, you know, before they could walk, I was, you know, messing with them around on the ground. And once they're big enough to walk, we're, you know, just kind of pushing and pulling with them and teaching them to have a good base and keep their feet underneath them. And they've been playing games that are similar to jujitsu their whole lives without really knowing what they were until later on. Um, and such as what? Just, um, hey, you know, hold your brother down and see if he can get up, you know. Oh, he got up. Okay, cool. Now, you know, see you lay down there and see if you can get up if he holds you down, you know. Or with the older son gotcha. before there was another one, I would just put my hand on his chest and say, can you turn into me? Oh, you're strong. Okay. Can you get up to your knees? Oh, wow, you did a good job, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he didn't really understand that there's a larger application to that when he was two or three years old, but he was making neuro connections and kind of solving things that he didn't know he was solving. I love that. My son's actually six. He just turned six, uh, June 12th. And, um, like I said, we had him in some classes, um, and him and I will wrestle and, and I'll do some, something similar where I'll just kind of, you know, put a little bit of pressure on top of him and say like, you know, how are you going to get out of this one? Yeah, sure. And he'll just have to have to figure it out, you know? So, yeah, cause they say it's, um, they say jujitsu is the human chess. It really is. Yeah. It's kinetic chess. Yeah. So I'm really big into um, the, the idea of mindset, right? And, you know, looking at where people's mindset are and how to shift it into a place that maybe it's better served. So with relation to the martial arts, you know, specifically jujitsu, because that's what we're talking about. But even without the aspect of martial arts, maybe you could just briefly describe your mindset and how maybe jujitsu has helped helped you or change your mindset, if at all, and then how that's been applied to your kids. Yeah, I think uh, jujitsu kind of teaches you to persevere and solve problems. You find yourself in uncomfortable positions often. Um, and there's always an eternal struggle for control and better position that's going on anytime you're grappling with another person. Um, and I definitely think that that carries over into a larger lesson for life that kind of like Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. Uh -huh. um, you know, you got to fight your way out of tough positions and you can't give up and you can't panic because panic is just going to suck you into a worse situation. You got to take a deep breath and assess your situation and find out what's causing the problem and fix it. Um, that certainly applies on the mat and I think it applies in life as well. And as a parent, you do the same thing. You see what's going on with your kids and try to come up with a plan that's going to put them on the right path and make sure that they grow up to be responsible adults and be one of the good guys and not one of the bad guys. Right. Because I think, you know, a lot of people will look at, uh, or maybe even listen to this and think, well, it's just a self-defense technique and it's just about, you know, overpowering somebody or maybe even just protecting yourself. But it does go deeper than that. Sure. Like you're saying. You know, and if you uh, it even opens up an opportunity for you to talk to them as a parent, as the father. Absolutely. And and teach them those life lessons through the experiences that they're having Definitely. on the mats. And just getting some, uh, having more self-confidence, you know, and not just even necessarily that, you know, you could defend yourself physically against somebody, but just having been through those trials by fire and seeing what you're made of time and time again, it just makes you feel more comfortable speaking up in a meeting or and interjecting your ideas and feeling like they're valid. And I've definitely known some people that are more career oriented and certainly not professional martial artists that I've trained that have. I've noticed they walk a little taller and a little more, more confident and just seem to be better able to project um, an air of, you know, confidence and that they know who they are and where they are and that they're in the right place doing the right thing. And I think that definitely um, is something that other people pick up on and kind of give you credit for. Mm hmm and have you noticed that? I know your children are still young, but have you seen that in either one of your boys? Absolutely. Both of them, for sure, um, are very confident and they have no problem 
sticking up for themselves and you know speaking up for themselves and they understand that they're to be treated with respect and they understand they have to treat other people with respect and i think they get the yin and yang of that you treat others like you want to be treated Mm -hmm. i mean obviously jujitsu's probably helped them with that and this is actually probably the best segue ever but um you know i i would like to think that probably a lot of that comes from you and your wife too and both of your parenting styles so tell her tell me and everybody else just a little bit about what what your parenting style is like and how would you describe that i um am fortunate because i think i'm friends with both of my kids and i think that's a delicate balance i think if you have to have one or the other that you need to have their respect and they need to understand that you're in charge but I think mm-hmm. if you do it right, that they can also feel like you're somebody that is their buddy that they enjoy hanging out with and doing fun things with. And I certainly have a blast with my sons all the time. And I think that the key is just that you set certain boundaries. You make sure that they understand what the rules are, what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. And you have consequences for them stepping over the line and what I see happen with a lot of parents is that they want to have a good relationship and a friendly relationship with their kids. And so when they step over the line, they tend to not want to correct them or discipline them, especially if they're in the moment of having fun and they don't want to ruin it by going negative. But I think you don't have to get mad and scream and holler at your kids. You can just, you know, calmly remind them, Hey, you know, you're not supposed to do this and you just did it. And so now you're going to go have your consequence and then you'll come right back and we'll keep having fun. For me, right. I use the consequences I use for my kids a lot of times is free squats. Um, I just have them do, hey, go give me 20 squats, go give me 50 squats. If it's severe, I'll make them do 100. Um, and it's, if anything, it's beneficial to them. As you know, it's not going to hurt them. Um, they're building some core strength for their body. And, you know, that's a great exercise to do. Um, and it's, it burns after a while and it's certainly monotonous to sit there and do a bunch of squats. And so they don't like doing them, Mm -hmm. Um, but they know that's what they have to do. Um, So typically that's what we'll do. We'll do some squats or some burpees or something like that. And that gets their attention and ultimately they're training and getting their, keeping their bodies in shape and moving a little bit. And so it's kind of a win-win. I love that. Having them actually do exercise and putting putting them through a little bit of physical pain with the lactic acid building up in their legs. That's yeah. That's, ge- that's yeah. genius. I, you know, like when I was in sports and stuff, you know, kid, the coaches would make us do push ups a lot of times, you know, and kids a lot of times can't do very many push ups, especially at my kid's age. So, but everybody can mm-hmm. do squats, you know. Absolutely. Every yeah. Kid can bend their knees and come back up. So it's a little less taxing for them. And it's something that like you said, they don't like doing it because there's a little bit of pain involved, but there's also a reward because they are getting stronger, you know, and they can, they can, each one of them can rip off a hundred free squats very easily now. So if anything, right, right. it's backfired on me that I got to make them do a whole bunch of them if I really want to punish them because they're pretty strong. <laughs> you know, I, my wife and I, uh, our son did something not too long ago and we knew that there had to be consequences and we, we do uh, like what you were saying about having that balance of being, you know, the authority figure, but then also being their friend. And I've seen the opposite, which you also mentioned too, about people just wanting to be the friend and not following through and not having the consequences and knowing those kids when they get older and how they've actually told me personally, you know, I, I wish they would just be my mom. I wish they would just be my dad because kids need that so much because they need that guidance. But then, like you said, you can also be their friend too, because there's that respect aspect. Well, once they've been told that there's a consequence and they do whatever is supposed to trigger that consequence, then they're going to learn a lesson at that moment about you. They're either going to learn that you follow through on your consequences or you don't. And if they find out that you're not going to, then they're going to run all over you. And pretty quickly you're going to be correcting big mistakes and big problems in their character as opposed to small little things that might seem insignificant to an outsider but you realize that if you lose that little bit of traction and control with them that you could have much bigger problems in the future and then you have to really go nuclear on them to try to get them to do anything because you've lost them at that point you know 
Yeah. And, no, um, and as long as you frame it, you know, they know what the rule is ahead of time and they know they broke it. And if they're having to be punished, then they know it's their fault. You know, it's not because mm-hmm. you're being mean to them and it's not because you're trying to just torture them. It's a direct punishment that they knew they were going to have that's directly tied to a decision they made that was the wrong decision. And then when it's over, it's over. You don't have to mean mug them for 20 minutes afterwards. You can go right back to what you were doing and they've served their time and give them a chance to correct and do better. Right. And so one, one of the things that my wife and I did was I gave him the option of what his consequence was. So instead of having him just pick it out of the clear blue, I mm-hmm. gave him two choices. And like I said, he's six. So every night I'll tuck him in and I'll sing him two songs or three songs, whatever it is. I'll sing to him. And he loves that. So I'll lay in bed, I'll rub his head for a little bit, and then I'll sing him some songs and then he'll, you know, that'll help him relax, go to bed. And the other thing he loves <laughs> is dessert <laughs> after dinner. Right. So, you know, he might have a sorbet popsicle or some organic ice cream that we might have or whatever it is, right? And he loves both of those. So I said to him, I said, I don't want to do it. I said, but there has to be consequences. So I told him up front, there has to be a consequence. I said, and these are your two options you're going to pick. And so that gets him in my mind at that particular point. That was the first time I did that. It got him invested into what his punishment was and almost held him accountable in a way because now he had to pick his poison. Yeah. Um, And if he's going to have to choose that again, what's he going to choose? So he actually wound up picking no dessert, which then melted my heart because it just showed how much he wanted me to sing to him and he was almost brought to tears but he chose no dessert and the next day he didn't even give us a hard time he didn't mention dessert he must have remembered because every single night he says hey mom dad can i have some dessert and so yeah. we'll say yes you know whatever and he didn't even bring it up the next day so it's great yeah I, I think it had a pretty big impact on him awesome yeah so i have to ask you know you're you're mentioning this this parenting style, which I think a lot of people can learn from and benefit from and implement themselves. Is this how your parents raised you? And is, is there a similarity there? Or is this something, you know, that you, that you developed on your own? I definitely think, you know, specifically my dad, um, kind of had the style where if he spoke up and said something he meant it, then he would reinforce that if necessary. And you knew that if he said something that you needed to pay attention. Um, so he didn't yell and bark and holler very often. And when he raised his voice or when he said, Hey, listen, and here's what's going to happen. We paid attention. Um, and, in our era, you know, um, spanking was still prevalent and my dad had a belt, um, that he spanked me and my brother with probably one or two times in our entire lives. Um, pretty, you know, humanely, but it was just a scary experience. And then all he had to do was threaten to go get that belt. And that was enough to get us to snap together. Um, <laughs> and my generation uh, is a little different, I guess. And I, my wife and I kind of made a decision when we had kids that we were going to see if we could avoid, you know, any corporal punishment and just give them when they were really little, we gave them time out and now we give them the squats and stuff like that. And um, that's not to disparage my parents, Um, you know, they certainly didn't beat us unnecessarily or, and that was the way they were raised. And that was pretty much how kids were punished. I remember when I was a little kid, I would get paddled by the principal or the teachers at school if I did something wrong. So I was just kind of considered the way to do it. But, you know, thinking, you know, in the modern era and also because my kids train, you know, to use violence to defend themselves, I think if I grabbed them and smacked them on the rear end to try to teach them something that, and to some extent, the lesson there is if somebody does something wrong, you punish them by hurting them, you know, Uh and I'm not sure that's the best lesson. And that's not the lesson I got in fairness from my parents was that, you know, you should do this to other people that when you're an adult, if somebody wrongs you, you should take your belt off and bend them over and spank them. But, um, I think that, you know, now that, you know, gen- our generation has had the benefit of some experts who have pointed out some alternatives to doing that, and just kind of some more positive reinforcement. And so 
that's kind of what we've gone with. But I definitely think that I owe a lot of my parenting style to my parents and particularly my dad. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it, I feel I feel like the the hitting and the physical aspect that you just mentioned is just that that primal instinct just mm-hmm. coming out and, and not having someone know how to tame it or how to channel it in a different way. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you might have that come across you, but then that comes out as give me a hundred squats. Yeah. And right. I think Instead it of actually really raising angry. your hand. Yeah. And I think it helps not to be like really angry and emotional about it. Just say, Hey, look, you know, you did this, you know, it was wrong. Here's the consequence, knock it out. And then if you come back and do right, then great. And if you don't, then it's going to be double that many. And, if that doesn't work, you're going to bed or whatever it is, you know, but um, I definitely think you can get the same message across and have them do something that's ultimately beneficial. I mean, even if it's, hey, go outside and pick all the weeds and the flower bed, you know, that's mm-hmm. not much fun to do, but it is beneficial to the family and it's work that needs to be done. And so I think you can find things like that, that, you know, are not going to be much fun for your kids and they'll consider it a punishment, but ultimately it's something that needs to be done. I could certainly argue that my son should be doing 50 or a hundred squats a day or every couple of days just for their physical fitness. So if they end up doing it as a kind of a consequence of just the inevitable being six and nine years old and not every, not always doing everything right the first time, then they're getting the exercise and the lesson. Right. And hopefully at some point it doesn't deter them from actually doing squats when they get older, right? To get them stronger. Yeah, better, I hope and, not. You know, yeah, whatever. They don't have like a bad feeling about squats and don't want to do them. Yeah, they look at a squat rack and just freeze up in the yeah, in the weight room some, or something. They may do so many of them as, a, as kids that they won't need to do anymore. <laughs> they'll be like, I'm squatted up. They'll have giant like thighs and be ready to go. Jump out of a building if they need to. Yeah. What When... Who came up with that? You or your wife about the squats? Um, that's probably a mutual decision. I, um, we both exercise and we both do squats for exercise. And so I think we just occurred to us that when they were putting them in timeout was, they're probably a little too old for that. We went to some physical exercise and so that's what we decided to do. Mm -hmm. So, Shifting to that, the physical exercise piece, obviously your kids get a lot from their punishments and also training Mm -hmm. uh, down at the gym uh, Mm -hmm. with with you and your wife. What are you shifting to the adult aspect of it? Are you training adults too? Yes. How do you see the level of fitness in your area specifically with the dads? And do you guys have – do you guys have uh, like father son mat time, or do you guys have uh, where you're mixing adults and kids, or you, you still keep it separate, right? We have the kids class right before the adult class, and lots of the kids that are in there are the children of adult students there. So uh, frequently they will come early and bring their kids, and then they'll help out with the kids class. So they're bonding with their kids and they're learning the same techniques their kids are learning so they can reinforce them at home. And it gives them an opportunity to do something that they both enjoy together. And and are these dads that are showing up or are these guys that are showing up already in great physical condition or are these guys that are just walking in and, you know, bellies hanging over or out of breath or, you know, who, who typically comes into your place or what you're seeing as far as the, the men in your area and the lifestyle that you can perceive that they're living? Uh, definitely there's a higher percentage of people that walk into a gym like mine that are going to be physically fit than just the average population but we also have people who come in that are pretty out of shape and pretty overweight and that changes fairly quickly if they adopt the lifestyle that we're offering and start training and eating better and taking better care of themselves um it kind of just inevitably happens but in my area in general um, in Oklahoma here in the Tulsa area, I would say that obesity is an epidemic like it is in most of the country. And I would say the majority of people here, um, are overweight and out of shape. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that it's something that as a society, we really need to tackle. I think that, you know, when you look around and everybody's out of shape, maybe there's a little bit less 
kind of peer pressure on you to get in shape because no, nobody else looks like they're in shape either. But um, I am a big believer that, you know, it's part of your job as a father, as a parent in general, but particularly as a father to kind of show if you don't have any, you know, disabilities or reasons that you can't control that would pr prohibit you from doing it. I think you should show strength and you should show what hard work and dedication looks like. And I think that, you know, the, the dad bod should be a strong athletic ripped dad that looks like he could take care of business if he needed to take care of you, lift something heavy for your mom if necessary. And a guy who cares about how he looks and what he's capable of doing physically. And I think that that sets a good example for your kids. And I think not being in shape sets a bad example for your kids, frankly. Absolutely. You mentioned lifestyle. Um, so besides doing jujitsu, what's, what are some other aspects of the lifestyle that you guys teach your students? Eating well, eating moderately. Um, I'm a big believer that sugar is, is a, a huge problem in our culture and that a lot of people are unaware that sugar is hidden in just about everything from a loaf of bread to a jar of tomato sauce. Mm -hmm. People don't even think to look in some of those food products for sugar but they've managed to pack it into just about everything that you buy and when you start looking at it and adding it up you really realize that it's you're consuming a lot of it and i think that's probably the biggest factor in obesity in this country and lots of other disease that has been tied back to sugar even uh the growth of tumors and you know cancer has apparently been tied with research to sugar consumption so um, I am pretty, uh, consistently preaching to the people who come to my class to watch your carbs and, you know, pay attention to your macronutrients and make sure that you're getting a good balance. You're eating enough calories, but not too many calories and that you're getting consistent exercise. And, you know, I think that watching the, watching the scale can be a little misleading for some people, because if you're adding muscle and losing fat. Sometimes it doesn't look like you're losing a lot of weight, but I think you got to look at how you feel and what your proportions are and, you know, what your body fat percentage is and what is a healthy size, you know, for you, which right. is different from one person to the next for sure. Absolutely. And I mean, just, just being comfortable with your body too, right? I mean, it's yeah. like, you know, you're getting on the scale and maybe it says 200 and someone thinks to themselves, wow, that sounds like a lot, but if you're yeah. happy with the way your clothes fit, you're wearing, you know, a 32, 34, depending on, you know, how big you are, what your, you know, uh, body shape is, then I think that's, you know, that's a healthy way of looking at it instead of thinking to yourself that you have to be this particular weight, because I know people will ask me about the BMI scale. You know, yeah. I, don't know I don't know if you guys get into that in, in, sure. in that world, because it's still fitness and training. So, you know, the that BMI is, scale, uh -huh. you look at somebody who's got, a good amount of muscle mass and maybe they're lean, but on the BMI scale, they're obese or overweight or something like that, you know? So yep. I think that's uh, there's a fine line there and, and people, it starts to mess with people's heads a little bit. And right. I think it's just about being, you know, being happy with yourself at the end of the day. I agree with you. I think another lifestyle thing that a lot of people lose track of, and I'm a pretty big proponent of is getting the right amount of sleep every day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for men, your testosterone production is going to be down. Your obviously your energy is going to be lower if you're not getting enough sleep. And sometimes people mistake being productive for not getting enough sleep. Like, oh yeah, I work 20 hours a day and sleep four. You know, and it's like, well, you know, you would probably do better sleeping eight hours a day, and and uh, you'd be more productive in the fewer hours that you were. Um, putting towards work absolutely you be completely focused and your body is just designed to work off of a certain amount of sleep and so sometimes it requires just cutting out some of the downtime unfortunately if you have a busy schedule the time when you would be sitting around for two hours from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock just watching a show to pass the time because you don't want to go to sleep and wake up the next day and have to start all over again and you just have to find the discipline to do that when your work is done, go to bed and feel satisfied that you've worked your butt off and you should kind of crash into your pillow with the last bit of energy you have every night and be tired because you've worked hard. And 
go to sleep, get eight hours of sleep and wake up and be ready to go the next day. Yeah. No, I totally agree with what you're saying about sleep because I, I feel like there's, there's certain people out there that are pushing, you know, the hustle. And sleepwalking through life. <laughs> sleepwalking through life. So th- there's people pushing the idea of hustle. Don't take it easy on yourself. Push harder. Right. Go, you know, yep. all this stuff. And, you know, it, whether it's in business or whether it's with your physical fitness. So you mentioned the word discipline. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I read the book. Uh, well, we're actually starting to read the second book, Way of the Warrior Kid. And if you've if you know what that book is, it's written by, uh, you know, Jocko Willink. Uh huh. So you know he's he's very big these days and very popular. And yeah. Maybe one day he'll be on this podcast. But uh, yeah. you know he he's, he has even said about sleep because people will listen to him and think to themselves, "Well, I I need to I need to be up at four forty five like Jocko, and I can't right. take it easy on myself." And discipline equals freedom. And and I agree with all that stuff. But he's also come out and said, if you actually listen to his very very first podcast he's actually said that he's kind of like a genetic freak that way. And his daughter's the same way. And he doesn't recommend only getting four to six hours of sleep for every single person. And right. he'll talk about his jujitsu, how it just goes to the wayside and his lifts aren't good anymore. And he'll have to really cut it back and take it easy. Um, and hopefully I'm not, you know, taking it out of context. And from what I remember of his very, very first podcast, but you know, it, you mentioned getting eight hours of sleep. I teach that in my own practice, because from what I've learned is that our circadian rhythms are based off of the sun and the moon. And Mm -hmm. we've only living this, we've only been living this stressful, hectic lifestyle for a very small portion of our human existence. And so if we're relying on the sun and fire for millions of years as our light source, then we're going to bed earlier right because there's nothing to do otherwise like you're saying you're not sitting in your room watching tv or or absolutely doing something like that you're getting to sleep because you have to get up and you know fight for your life provide for your family go out and find find food build shelter you know whatever you know whatever we were doing millions of years ago so um and that's really how our bodies are genetically designed and evolution doesn't really care about television and that's right you know making a million dollars every you know a year or something like that or uh you know people hashtagging hustle and you know hit the grind and all that stuff so i i like i like that you brought up the the fact of sleep and i really love the fact that you guys are incorporating this into into your studio into into jujitsu and and into the lifestyle i think that's that's awesome. Well, you cannot pick the day when somebody might try to attack you or attack your family. So if you kind of generally eat good food and get a good night's sleep and feel pretty good every day and keep yourself physically fit, then you're going to be ready when that moment comes. It's not like being a professional fighter where you know that you got six weeks to prepare and you got to fight on this Saturday on this date. Mm-hmm. could be when you wake up and go walk your dog in the morning could be on your way home at night you never know yeah so, and prepare it all the time is kind of a necessary part of being a warrior absolutely and what would you say to that person who just heard you say that because i can hear some of those voices out there those people thinking well why is he preparing for a fight that may never come and you know is this guy you know this guy just sounds paranoid or something like that of course, me, I would say it's being prepared. And a friend of mine said a long time ago, you know, I put my seatbelt on every single time I get in the car. That doesn't mean I'm paranoid about getting into an accident. Right. So what would you say about that when you were saying, you know, training for that, um, you know, for that situation, that moment where you're just getting up or, you know, end of the day? Yeah. What do you say to the whole paranoid versus being prepared? Um, I think it's my primary job. You know, it's a perfect time to mention this on the Warrior Dad podcast. Um, My primary job on this earth is to protect my family. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are certainly bad people on this earth that would do harm to my kids if they could and would do harm to my wife, even me, if they were capable of it or if we gave them the opportunity. Um, And so, you know, that doesn't mean we don't go places or we don't um, enjoy our lives, but it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it Mm -hmm. as far as training goes. And so, um, I have, since I've trained 
thousands of people throughout my life, I've certainly come across police officers and everyday people who have gotten into a fight that they weren't prepared for and things went south on them quickly. And at that moment, they would have traded whatever they were doing during the times when I was training, um, whether it was sitting on the couch or whatever it is, you know, even playing golf or something else that's not specifically related to being able to provide defense and protection to yourself and those around you. They would trade all that time, all the, all the extra time they spent at work and money they made there in that moment they'd probably give away everything they own to save their own life or more importantly to save their wife's life or their kid's life or just some innocent person who's being hurt Mm -hmm. in their presence and you can't make that deal at that moment you can't trade it (laughs) you can't trade time you can't trade it you either you're either ready or you're not um and i don't think that necessarily everybody on the planet needs to be doing that um certainly not everybody is capable of defending themselves or others. Some people are too old or too young or too small or um, have some physical disabilities, but there's certainly a warrior class in our society, police officers, firemen, EMTs, you know, even nurses, doctors, teachers, um, who are military, um, who have taken it upon themselves to be ready when the worst happens and you know there's an er doctor right now who's ready for 20 gunshot wounds to come through the door he hopes it doesn't happen but he has to be ready because if it does those people's lives are going to be in his hands and whether he's ready or not is going to depend on whether they live or die so Uh there are lots of people who live with that reality and i think a certain percentage of people and they tend to just kind of be born with the feeling to want to do that kind of the sheepdog mentality of having similar characteristics to the wolf being strong and fast and having sharp teeth and being um, versed in violence. But unlike the wolf who wants to attack old ladies or little kids or the weak uh, members of the flock, the sheepdog is born with, you know, uh, compassion for weaker people and wants to use his power to protect them and to confront the wolf. And um, there's always been people like that, and there always will be. And I try to find those people and cultivate that in them and encourage them to sharpen those skills because every generation on this planet has the responsibility to make sure that the good guys are better trained for violence than the bad guys. And if we ever lose that edge, we'll lose our freedom. Mm-hmm. So it's it's absolutely essential in my opinion. I love that. I love everything you said right there. That was perfect. That was perfect. (laughs) And I'm glad you actually, um, uh, I'm glad you cleared up for some people that might not know what sheepdog means. Um, I I like like that you, you know, you clarified that. And I definitely resonate with that sheepdog. Uh, I think it was probably even before when we were talking on the podcast that, but you know, I'm an older brother and I've always had that uh, protective side of me for not only my younger sister but then also my friends and my family and just really anybody that's around me yeah and even if i don't know them and i see someone taking advantage of somebody else it just it it sparks something inside of me and yeah, you're, you're a sheepdog <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're born with the dna for sure yeah so you know Thank i God for people like you and and yourself who are training other people you know so that's you know, so this is just one piece of it, but then, you know, have building that confidence through self-defense and hand-to-hand combat. I think I heard on when you were on uh, the Sheepdog Response podcast, you carry a gun and a knife with you every day, correct? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So likewise. And, um, it, you know, again, it's not about being paranoid. It's about being prepared. And, you know, a knife is a tool and a yep. gun is a tool. And, you know, I carry a pocket knife as well as a self-defense knife and because the pocket knife has one purpose and the self-defense knife has another and um it's just how you use that tool and when you need that tool um is it available to you you know do you and and do you know exactly like you're saying how to use it do you have those skills so because the world doesn't seem like it's getting any safer you know and some people will say well now it's more media that we have and all that stuff but it's like yeah but you know uh 
you know, when people are getting acid thrown on them and people are getting run down by cars and, you know, stabbed on bridges and stuff like that. Um, And, you know, even close to here is close to me is Philadelphia. And I was born and raised in Philly. And uh, one of my clients knew somebody who was running down in the city, broad daylight. And then just someone comes right up to her, slashes her right in the face with a knife while she's running. Oh, and it's like, what, what's the point? You know, mm-hmm. and I don't even think they took anything. Um, so it's, you, you know, you just never know. So I, I love like that you said Like the Joker that. said, some people just want to see the world burn. Yeah, ex- some absolutely. People will, some people will slice some woman's face with a knife for no other reason than to do it. Yep. It's, a, it's a mentality that's hard for people like us to understand, but we have to understand that there's people like that, you know? Right. And um, and you mentioned yin that, and yang earlier, and without without hate, there would be no love and vice versa. So there's always going to be that aspect because there has to be that aspect. Yeah, um, well, and the only thing that stops people like that from doing that more often is they, they know that a sheepdog will show up and hold them accountable, usually a police officer who will find them and chase them down and put them in handcuffs and arrest them and take them to jail and charge them with slicing that woman's face. Mm-hmm. And there are that group of people particularly who hold that blue line or law enforcement across the country um, are definitely not given the respect that they deserve from our society if you consider the fact that the smallest weakest least trained police officer on your department if you called in 911 and said there's five guys with machine guns in my house hunting my family down and trying to kill us he or she would pull their patrol car into your driveway and get out with their little pistol and run into your house and put their life on the line against almost insurmountable odds because it's their job and they're sworn to do it Uh and they would do it. And a lot of us don't have close friends that would do that for us as much as they love us. They just wouldn't be able to bite that off. And so if you consider that those people are there and that if they decided to announce that they're all going to take a day off tomorrow, people would crawl out of the woodwork that you couldn't even imagine. And they'd do things that none of us could comprehend. And the only thing that stops them is that small group of sheepdogs who are there every day. And they know that they'll hold them accountable and they'll do whatever it takes to stop them. Uh And so that is a very thin line that they hold. And it's absolutely essential to keeping us all safe and, it's what stops the bad guys from coming to the nicer neighborhoods and kicking the doors in and taking everything that, that those people own is just that they're protected by the small warrior class that's willing to to fight to the death to protect other people. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Well, Blake, I want to end um, with a few questions for you, but this was a great place to stop, but I want to end with a couple questions. Uh, Inspired by James Lipton and uh, Bernard Pivot, I have uh, I have some questions. So, Blake, who is your hero? My hero is definitely my father. What excites you? Helping other people achieve their goals. What turns you off? The wolf. <laughs> Likewise. What is your favorite sound? My kids laughing. What is your least favorite sound? My kids crying. What is your favorite quote or saying? Be present. Say that again. Be present. Be present. I like that. In one word, what should a dad be? Reliable. In one word, what should a dad not be? <laughs> Unreliable. <laughs> Um, yeah uncommitted okay if you could do anything else in life what would it be I don't think I could do anything else in life I think I was put on this earth to do one thing and I'm doing it Um, you know I would probably find some other way to try to force multiply and help other people that to be able to hold that line that's just kind of my passion in life and so if I wasn't doing it with physical skills maybe I would try to teach some more mental you know maybe the more mental side of it or situational awareness or something to keep people safe okay last question what would you like to be remembered for 
you know, I, I would say this even if it, I wasn't on the Warrior Dad podcast, but I'd like to be remembered as a good father. I'd like for my kids to look back on their lives and know that I did the best I could for them. I think that's my primary job on this earth is to provide for them as best I can. So if somebody was going to say anything about me, I'd hope they say I was a good dad. I love it. Blake, thank you so much. We're, um, thank you for spending this almost this hour. Um, we've been talking for an hour, but recording this for an hour now. So I really, really appreciate it. And, um, we've, Blake and I have never talked before today. So it was a real honor. We got to talk for a few minutes before, uh, before we started this, but, um, I've, I've learned a lot just from listening to you. I love everything that you said. And, um, Again, I appreciate you coming on here. Thanks. It was a pleasure. And um, I wish you the best. And thanks for doing this. I think it's a great, great idea and a great way to help educate dads on how to be better fathers and and, uh, raise better kids. Thank you. And finally, let everybody know where they can find out more about you, your program, your any information about you. You can go to sheepdogtulsa.com. That's my gym in Tulsa. And we have uh, training events occasionally here for people that can come in from out of town and train. Um, you could also check out C4C Combatives, uh, which is at pfctraining.com. And uh, that's a company that's been around for about 20 years and they do uh, defensive tactics training for law enforcement and military. And I um, help teach uh, for them. I'll be in Pennsylvania next week teaching some military members Uh, a few weeks ago we were out in Las Vegas teaching some defensive tactics instructors so trying to take whatever we know and hand it off to the people who need it the most nice we're in Pennsylvania uh we are going to be in Harrisburg oh okay I'm only about two hours from there hour and a half maybe great like that yeah well if you want to come out and check out some of the training you're certainly welcome is it for law enforcement only? It's military. It's a it's a class for military, but I'm sure you could come take a look if you wanted. Okay. Sounds good. All right. We'll have to uh we'll have to text a little bit more about that afterwards. Okay, sounds great. <laughs> All right, Blake. Thanks so much and have a great All day. Right, you too. Thanks, bye bye. Thanks, bye. Hey guys, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Warrior Dads Podcast. If you like this podcast and want to support it, please subscribe, leave comments and share it with someone you think would benefit from listening as well. Thanks again, and keep on being a warrior dad.